Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from Long Now Foundation. All the space aficionados are sort of marveling at this steampunk technology <laughs> we're just looking at here. And I'm holding up the book because the book is in the lobby and it's worth getting. This is such a classic Long Now subject and sort of twice over because you're already getting a message, 40,000 years, 100,000 years. Uh, it's a long time to get to one of these distant stars or even the close stars. So you already have to think long term to whatever technique you develop and list really seriously faster than light travel. So then you kind of work back from that horizon to the horizon of what will it take to develop interstellar travel. And what I love about the Starship Century, the 100-year Starship, these several different projects that are converging and diverging, is that they realize it'll take 100 years to solve the problem. It's very much like climate change. And what a fortunate century we live in to have such interesting problems to solve climate change and figure out how the hell to get to the stars. The perfect person to talk about it from a long now standpoint is one of our founding directors and one of the leading futurists in the world, Peter Schwartz. Thanks, Stuart. It really is a, a treat for me to be here uh, with all of you. I know many of you, a lot of my friends are in the audience, uh, and we've shared a lot of uh, ideas together over the years uh, with Long Now Foundation. So it's a real pleasure for me to be a part of this this evening. And for me, this is also very personal. Um, uh, I, I'm, an, I, I'm actually a rocket scientist. Um, that's my degree. It's the only virtue of my degree I get to say that, that I'm actually a rocket scientist. Uh, well, I say that because uh, you know, I graduated from uh, college in 1968 just as the space program had kind of peaked and was on its way down uh, uh, after Apollo. Uh, I worked on Apollo, but uh, there wasn't too much future after that. I, I actually did want to be an astronaut. Uh, I grew up with science fiction as a kid. You know, I, Destination Moon, Forbidden Planet, Flash Gordon, uh, these were the things that, that set me in motion. And I have been a reader of science fiction all these years. Um, and still enjoy it enormously. Uh, but what now has happened is that it becomes actually possible to think about some things that were only possible in our imagination a few years ago. The, 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 the biggest thing that has happened that really has begun to change our thinking is that we realize that our planet is not alone in the universe. Until a, a, a few years ago, we really didn't know if uh, our solar system was really quite unique, that you know, there might be just one solar system and a bunch of stars with nothing around it. Well, what we now know as a result of ground-based telescopes and some space-based telescopes like Kepler is that, in fact, planets are very common. Most stars have planets. In fact, there are more planets than there are stars, and there are many billions of stars, so there are many, many, many billions of planets. So what it means is there's some place to go. And that is uh, a big discovery. That's new. We didn't know that. Uh, now, hopefully, some of those places are interesting places to go. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that is the first big discovery. Now, there's something else that has developed that I'll share with you in a little while, or actually, Freeman Dyson will share with you in a little while, uh, that also influences our thinking. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is report, uh, first of all, on the logic of, of this, which I'll come back to in a moment, as well as a conference that took place recently on the Starship Century. And the book, which Stuart held up, that my friend and colleague over here, Jim Benford, uh, Jim, wave, so everybody knows who you are, and you'll see Jim on screen in a few minutes. Uh, Jim uh, and his brother, uh, Greg, uh, put together this book, uh, got a number of people to write about it, and uh, when Jim and Greg approached me with the idea of participating in the book, basically the, the question they asked was, can we think in some way rigorously about whether this is a plausible possibility? Is this something really worth thinking about? And so I actually was able to bring together the two threads of my life, one of which is space and astronautics and one of my real personal passions, which I have not been able to exercise for a very long time, and scenario planning. That is, the uh, thinking about the future in the long term in terms of multiple scenarios. 
So what I was able to do in the course of participating in this project with Jim and uh, the other writers who uh, were involved in this uh, was to actually think through in a fairly rigorous way uh, the possibilities for getting to the stars and to see if the question that I've asked up there is galactic civilization inevitable? Is that a meaningful question? And what's the answer to that question? And, and I'll save that answer till the end. Uh, so what I've done here is, first of all, to lead you through, and my slides are fairly simple, the, the logic of my thinking and, and reasoning and analysis here. But equally important, uh, we had a, a, a very interesting conference at UC San Diego in May that Jim and Greg organized with a number of the uh, writers from the conference, uh, from the book, uh, as science fiction writers, scientists, and others. And so I'm going to take you to that conference in a few video clips. And you'll see Jim on screen uh, uh, with a few of the people and the presentations, and let them speak for themselves, the different scientists and writers who are participants in that conference. And as you'll see, some of them are people you've seen here. Neil Stevenson spoke, uh, Werner Vinge spoke, uh, uh, Freeman Dyson, whom you all uh, I'm sure No uh, spoke and gave a very important talk, and he revealed a new idea, which I will save for a little while, because it also uh, changes the nature of the game. It's a game-changing idea in a very big way. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you through the thought process of these scenarios, as well as to share with you uh, some sense of uh, what was happening at this conference. And in fact, I'm going to begin with Jim Benford. After I turn on my clicker. I'm going to begin with Jim Benford. And uh, Jim begins with telling us just why this is such a hard problem. Jim? The outer solar system has a lot of promise, a lot of interesting phenomena, the Kuiper Belt, the Oort or or Cloud, and you're going to hear about that this morning and some speculative ways from Freeman Dyson. Uh, the distance out to the, to the stars themselves is absolutely enormous. As you can see, Alpha Centauri is 300,000 AU out uh, of enormous distance, uh, 4.3 light years. And uh, the other targets in there are going to be the nearer term things that we could possibly send probes to. And that's the scale of what I just told you. And you can see we're way down here at unit one. Uh, Alpha Centauri is up there in astronomical terms, really. And uh, then we've got the heliosphere in here where we interface with the, uh, with the galaxy itself and uh, the interstellar medium, which has not quite been reached, maybe yes, maybe no, by the void. So now we know, in fact, it has been reached. Uh, Jim made this statement a few months ago, and we've now there. So uh, Voyager has actually reached it. But the point is, this is a really hard problem. It's really, really, really far away. Any of you who were you know, fans of a Hitchhiker's Guide, you know, this is really big. Um, and uh, the, the, the challenge, and why it's so interesting, is this. That our solar system, as beautiful as it is uh, seen by Voyager 2 and Voyager 1, is actually fairly boring. I mean, the truth is that, you know, uh, Venus is too hot and Mercury is really too hot. Mars is too cold and arid. And then we got a bunch of gas giants and some moons and stuff. And we'll explore all of that. But it isn't very habitable. And, you know, we've all seen these amazing pictures of Mars. They're truly wonderful. But, you know, it's like living in a really arid Siberia, uh, you know, or Antarctica without ice. Um, so it is not a, a place you really want to spend much time. And maybe someday we'll terraform it, make it a bit more habitable, and we may explore some of the moons of Jupiter and uh, Saturn and so on. And if you haven't seen, there's a wonderful little new uh, science fiction film called Europa Report, which is kind of fun about uh, reaching Europa, uh, uh, a, a good little science fiction film. But basically, our neighborhood is pretty boring. Uh, and if we are really to uh, explore the universe, we are going to have to get to other stars. We're going to have to get to other star systems. And the distances are just simply almost insurmountable. And th that's what the challenge is. But really, is it insurmountable? Well, I'm not so sure. Uh, and in fact, Jim found a remarkable little forecast, uh, a prediction, if you will, uh, and I will let Jim tell you about the prediction. Now, predictions are hard to do, and most people are not willing to do them. But Freeman Dyson did 45 years ago in his prescient article in Physics Today, a, a, a renowned journal, my favorite magazine, 
edited at that time by Gloria uh, Lubkin, who is with us here. And the article was written by Freeman Dyson, who is also with us here. Now we'll tell you, Freeman, what you said then. <laughs> I predict that in about 200 years from now, barring a catastrophe, the first interstellar voyages will begin. Well, we're almost, <laughs> we're, approaching, uh, we're approaching a quarter of that time now. Dyson has doubled in age, and perhaps later today we might hear what he thinks about the matter now. And, and we will in a few minutes. Uh, but. Uh, I think it is actually quite significant that someone like Freeman Dyson, one of the great physicists of the last century, man of enormous intelligence and depth, uh, we've all had the pleasure of hearing him speak and reading his writing for many, many years, actually believes it's quite plausible, that uh, the ways of getting there are quite imaginable, and that the path may not be quite as difficult as we thought. Uh, so uh, Having Freeman behind me, backing me, helps a lot, to be honest. That uh, you, you have someone like Freeman be, uh, uh, Dyson uh, uh, watching your back, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, so what's really hard here? What's the hard problem? Well, the problem is twofold. The first is uh, energy, uh, power. How do you power a vehicle to get to the stars? Um, and it is a really, really long way. It's going to take an enormous amount of energy to get there. Uh, whatever means we use, it's going to take an enormous amount of energy. And I'll talk a little bit about what that might mean. And the second big problem is, as was suggested by the voyage length of the voyagers, the voyages are going to be long unless we have really amazing faster than light travel if we're in the Star Trek world, which we'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, unless we have that, these are going to be voyages of decades, centuries, and maybe even millennia. And so the question is, how do we keep people alive? for all of that amount of time. You know, we know how to keep people alive for weeks, months, maybe even a year in space on the space station, but getting to planets is already difficult. Getting to stars is almost insurmountable. Uh, so those are the two big challenges, technically. How do you power a spaceship, and how uh, do you keep people alive? So we're going to spend a bit of time talking about the fundamental question of how, and then I want to go on to the question of why because it actually does matter why we want to go there. And then put all that together in a couple of several scenarios for how we might get there and what that might uh, tell us. So first of all, let's look at the question of can we? Uh, and that is, how do we propel it? And let me say, these slides are just kind of considered an outline of the argument. Well, the first answer is, no, we can't. Uh, and that is, uh, if you ask most scientists and engineers today, they would say, no, probably not going to happen. Uh, it's just te technically too hard, um, uh, too big, too costly, uh, and therefore probably not going to happen. Yes, we can imagine maybe getting around our solar system, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but moving across the vast interstellar distances, almost certainly not. And, you know, most scientists would say that. But a few are beginning to think about other possibilities. And so the second category that I have there is slow. And by slow, I mean less than the speed of light. Uh, and that is fairly slow, a few tens of thousands of miles an hour. Think Voyager. Uh, maybe a bit faster, a few hundreds of thousands of miles we, an hour. We haven't gotten to that. But maybe even if you have something accelerating for a long time, maybe even a million miles an hour might get us there. But all that is still relatively slow compared to the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles a second. Okay, So our... You know, our solar system is about something like 20 light hours across, okay? So it's, to go the whole solar system, you know, from one side to the other is maybe at the speed of light, roughly around 20 hours. Well, we're talking about four light years to the nearest star. So years versus hours, that's the kind of light, what light does for you. So almost everything below the speed of light is slow. Uh, then there's the outlandish possibility. FTL stands for faster than light. Uh, we'll even come to that possibility. So the various scientists who spoke at this conference actually laid out a number of different possibilities for answering these questions in some detail. So let's look at, first of all, why it is really so hard. Now, I said I worked on Apollo, and Jim uh, Benford is going to tell us why Apollo was wimpy. This, 
is a, so, a sobering slide because you don't see things to scale very much, but that's Daedalus, unmanned, now referred to as uncrewed, the, uh, the, uh, and um, going to, uh, 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 compared to the Apollo, uh, which it was manned, of course, and it's absolutely enormous. The problems with starships is they don't scale well, and we're talking about scaling to very, very high speeds. They're, they're very large, they're very expensive, they're very inefficient in terms of payload. The, the uh, uh, Apollo uh, missions had about a 3% payload uh, fraction. That is 97% of the, of the, of the, of the entire machine uh, was gone by the time uh, you got something on, on target. In fact, you saw uh, precisely that phenomenon in the video we saw earlier. You saw all those pieces of a Titan 3C launch vehicle falling away, then the upper stage boosters falling away, then the Voyager booster falling away, and then finally you had the actual Voyager that was left. And the problem is that these are chemical rockets, right? So chemical rockets use various forms of fuel, hydrazine or alcohol or kerosene or uh, hydrogen and oxygen, but basically it's a chemical reaction of some sort. Uh, and you are limited by the chemistry uh, of what's plausible there by way of con combustion. So you'd have to carry an enormous amount of fuel if you wanted to fly for any distance. So chemical rockets are not going to get us to the stars. They probably are not even going to get us to the planets, but they certainly are not going to get us to the stars. So what lies beyond that? Well, today we have a source of power on Earth which generates an enormous amount of energy from a relatively small volume of fuel, and that's nuclear power. Um, and so, in fact, what we had was Jeff Landis from NASA talking about the possibilities for nuclear rockets. But the nice thing about nuclear thermal rockets is this is not an imaginary technology. This is not view graphs. Uh, these are real. During the 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s, when the NASA plan was that we go to the moon and then move on to Mars, uh, they said, well, we're going to have to develop these. There were several programs. Uh, one called NERVA, Nuclear Energy for Rocket Vehicle Applications, one called ROVER. Uh, a little bit later, there was a follow-on project called Timberwind, uh, which in fact was mostly a, a paper study. Uh, but they actually built and tested uh, these rocket engines. And here's several of these nuclear rocket engines that were built and tested uh, during the 1970s. Uh, so, Nuclear rocket could very well become the workhorse of the solar system. So this, this is how you would fly around the solar system with a nuclear rocket. And in fact, when uh, Stuart and uh, Xander and I think Kevin and I all went down to, the, uh, to see Yucca Mountain, where the, uh, uh, they were going to use that as the waste dump, with the sites for these rocket tests were still actually there. You could see the now decaying sites of the uh, nuclear test facilities for nuclear-powered rockets, the same place we were testing nuclear weapons, I might add. Uh, so these were actually built, never flown in space, but it is plausible that we could revive this. This is uh, uh, within our technical grasp. So this is not something that is the distant possibility. If we choose to do this, this is something we could actually do within the next 20, 30 years. Uh, and this, as a source of propulsion, is probably sufficient to get us to Mars, maybe to Jupiter, Saturn, the, the near neighborhood, maybe even the entire solar system you might begin to explore with nuclear fission rockets. And, you know, if you saw uh, 2001, that was probably a nuclear fission rocket in that long uh, discovery uh, ship that they were flying on their way out to Jupiter. It looked a bit like the one here on screen. However... Nuclear fission is limited in its power. We have another nuclear technology which we imagine, which is nuclear fusion, where you're getting more power out of a smaller and smaller volume. The only problem with nuclear fusion is that the only thing we really know how to do with it is build a bomb so far, a big bomb. And nobody has yet been able to harness nuclear fusion to use it for any functional purpose, e.g. for power or anything else. Uh, we have a project over here in Lawrence Livermore Labs, the uh, National Ignition Facility, trying to use laser beams to compress hydrogen and produce fusion. Uh, uh, Europe has something called the ITER, uh, the International Thermo, uh, Thermonuclear Energy Research Facility, and it is uh, using magnetic fields to try and compress hydrogen to produce nuclear fusion. Uh, and that may happen. 
but neither one of them has yet succeeded in producing a sustained nuclear fusion reaction. Now, there's reason to think that it may be plausible within the next few decades, but we ain't there yet. And this is already a hard physics problem and an even harder engineering problem. But it is reasonable to imagine that over the next 50 to 100 years, uh, that we would actually be able to develop a fusion rocket. So uh, let's take a look at one concept. There was a, a physicist named uh, Bussard who came up with the idea of a ramjet using, in fact, interstellar hydrogen. There's a lot of little bits of hydrogen out there and hydrogen fuel being sucked in by magnetic fields. So Adam Crowell described a Bussard ramjet. So yeah, uh, this concept was, well, this one was visualized originally by uh, Rick Sternbach. Um, for uh, Cosmos, but Adrian Mann has uh, revisualized it here, pointing out all the basics. So you've got your magnetic field structure, um, possibly a, a giant torus hidden behind this thing, and then all these other sort of hand-waving sections thrown in, plus the uh, fusion drive, which any properly operating fusion drive should probably be glowing white hot. So. An improvement in an engineering sense. There was a bit more detail with this concept um, once they figured out the right fusion reaction. Yeah, all my fusion rockets are white hot. Uh, but the, the truth is, of course, that we really don't know how to build this yet. But we can at least imagine and understand a fair amount about the physics of this. And so the idea is that this is a giant magnetic field at the front, just like a, a, an air scoop on a jet engine is sucking in oxygen to feed the the fuel on board in the jet engine. This is sucking in hydrogen and feeding it into a fusion reactor and pushing it out the back end and producing an enormous amount of thrust uh, on a long-term basis. Now you don't have to take most of your fuel with you because it's out there in the interstellar medium. So it becomes a plausible vehicle for that purpose. Uh, so that's the second concept for a slow rocket. And remember, these guys may be going really fast by our terms, but we're still in the slow space. And then the final concept uh, is the idea of sail ships, giant ships now powered by some kind of beam, like say light beams. And again, Jim Benford helps us understand what a sail ship might be like. So Bob Forward came up with this kind of scheme. <clears throat> uh, for optics reasons, you use a, a la this is in laser frequencies, uh, use a laser, and the beam hits a, uh, a, a Fresnel lens, which gives it good focal properties, and accelerates the light sail. <clears throat> In his model, he was going to go to Epsilon Iridani. In this idea, basically, what you've got a laser beam somewhere in, uh, near the Earth, maybe in or orbit near Venus, uh, collecting huge amounts of sunlight, uh, converting that to electricity and producing a laser beam that points out into deep space. You have a giant sail many, many miles across, capturing that sunlight and powering uh, the vehicle forward, just like a sail might be powered by the wind. Uh, and so uh, th this idea has actually been tried on a very, very small scale in Earth orbit. I mean, tiny little sails. But in general, the physics of this is well understood. Now, it's a huge engineering problem. Imagine building a vast solar array, vast lasers, and so on, somewhere out in deep space, uh, and trying to uh, uh, pilot a vehicle uh, into uh, interstellar space. Now, one of the, in fact, the, the, the things I didn't include in this talk was Neil Stevenson's talk, in which he, uh, actually, and I'll just mention it, uh, that is that uh, he spoke about a, building a tower 20 kilometers high as a way of launching rockets and getting extra impulse from the spin of the Earth uh, and also figuring out how to do really big engineering. Imagine a tower 20 kilometers high, right? Uh, in fact, I think he put it over here in the Central Valley and uh, you, you, you would be able to see it, of course, it would be higher than anything in the Sierras. You'd be able to see it from downtown San Francisco easily. Uh, it's a great story. And in the book, there's a, a short story about it. Uh, at the end of my talk, I'll put up the URL so you can see all the videos if you want. Uh, you can go online and you can see Neil's talk about building the 20-kilometer uh, tower. So uh, these are the slow vehicles for getting to the stars. But of course, there's one more outlandish possibility. Uh, and that is the idea of going faster than light. 
But that means reinventing physics, because today physics tells us that the speed of light is the upper limit for any matter. Above that, it basically becomes energy. E equals mc squared, right? We all understand that. The energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So you take some mass and you start moving it up at that light, it's going to turn to energy and you are essentially a light beam. Well, that's not a way to get to the stars. Uh, uh, you are a thermonuclear reaction yourself. Uh, so if we are going to do that, we really have to reinvent physics. So the question is, is that plausible? Well, I live in North Berkeley, uh, home of many Nobel laureates. Uh, we have pools on who wins the next Nobel Prize. And uh, the most recent winner in the neighborhood was uh, Saul Perlmutter. Uh, Saul lives a few doors up the street on Poplar Street where I live. And Saul won the Nobel Prize two years ago for discovering dark energy. He was, uh, led the team at Berkeley that made the historic discovery, one of the great discoveries of the last half century, that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate that something is overcoming gravity and leading all the objects in the universe to move further away from each other at an accelerating rate. So there's some mysterious force, which they name dark energy, to go along with the other mysterious mass called dark matter, uh, that uh, is overcoming gravity and producing an effect which we don't really understand. The word dark means we don't know what it is. Uh, Literally, we haven't the slightest clue what dark energy is and what dark matter is. But we know it's there because we can see the effects. So, you know, Star, uh, Saul's a friend, and I went for a walk with him not long ago, and I asked him the question. You know, look, uh, if you think about the history of physics and, you know, astronomy and so on, there was that moment about 500 years ago when we still thought that the sun went around the Earth, and then along comes Copernicus and Tycho and Galileo and those guys, and they figured out, well, you know, maybe the mathematics of orbits would be a little bit easier if we put the Earth going around the sun. And lo and behold, it turned out to be a whole lot easier, and that is, in fact, the way the universe works. And we reinvented our universe. Um, about 100 years ago, we did it again with Einstein and Bohr, with relativity and quantum theory. And again, we got a real revisioning of our model of physics. So I asked Saul, I said, look, you know, you've discovered dark energy. There's dark matter. There are mysterious strings. Uh, our friend Martin Rees believes there's Martin, there are multiple universes. I mean, the universe has gotten kind of weird. Isn't this a bit like the sun going around the Earth? Uh, might we not reinvent physics to make it all work a bit more simply? And he said, yes, that's possible. It is possible that we might end up reinventing physics in a quite fundamental way. Well, there are two possibilities. The universe is weird, and that may be true, or we're going to reinvent physics at some point along the way. Now, there's no guarantee that in that reinvention, we will find a way to go faster than the speed of light, but it at least becomes imaginable. In fact, so much so that NASA actually has scientists today working on an idea for using wormholes. So, in fact, let's look at what that might look like from John so Kramer. So in summary, uh, we, assuming that stable wormholes exist and that we can master the physics and engineering of microscopic wormholes, we may be able to use them to explore uh, the stars and to colonize extrasolar planets. The time-spanning properties of relativistic wormholes can be used to reach distant star, star systems in very short times on the order of days or weeks or months. And wormhole time link connects, uh, connections to the present when the wormhole is launched to the future uh, <clears throat> means that you, can't, you can go there without having to wait. Uh, basically, you're creating an Einstein-Rosen bridge to the stars. Uh, now, I should also point out that this idea I presented in a 1990 column, so it's been around a while. And as far as I know, nobody, no science fiction writer has taken, a, taken it up as a, uh, uh, <clears throat> a basis for a story. So I'm Actually, I think there is one, Peter Hamilton, but that's another point. But the point is that we are beginning to imagine ways of even modifying our existing models of physics to create ways to create short distances through vast distances of space. The idea of a wormhole connecting two points in space and time and somehow being able to go through there from one place to the other. And instead of taking centuries and millennia, days, weeks, hours to get from here to somewhere vastly distant. Now, this is really at the outer realm of not even plausible, but barely imaginable today. Uh, but if you think about it, therefore, we've got a whole bunch of slow concepts, uh, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, sail, and even the possibility of reinventing physics to come up with new ways of getting there. So it does seem at least there, we have some ways of thinking about the question of energy and propulsion. Well, then the next question is, how do we live long enough? How do we 
actually survive there. And so here there are, are four basic ideas. And, and the first is one that actually has been a number of stories. And in fact, uh, in Whole Earth Review, Stewart once uh, spent several issues covering space colonies, which were basically asteroids that had been hollowed out, and people lived inside the asteroid, and they grew food, and there were new kinds of power sources, and so on. Well, you can imagine that kind of a vehicle that goes from here to uh, distant stars, but takes many generations. And uh, the people who leave uh, don't get there. They die, and their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, many generations later, are the ones who actually reach the distant stars, having uh, lived many generations on board a ship. So that's one concept. Second concept are sleep ships. Anybody who saw uh, Avatar will remember what that was like. You know, basically people go to sleep for X number of years, and then you get wakened when you get there uh, using some kind of suspended animation. And upon arrival, uh, you have not aged except a little bit. Uh, and as a result, uh, essentially you're able to make voyages of many, many, many years. Uh, now, that, again, both of these are concepts which we can imagine with today's science. It's not thoroughly implausible to get uh, to either of those. The third possibility is what you might call relativistic ships. And one of the consequences of uh, Einstein's theory of relativity is that if you're moving fast enough relative to another object, you experience time differently than that object you were, have recently left. So if you imagine, say, twins, one on the Earth and one on a relativistic ship, uh, the guy on Earth experiences time as we all do, but the guy who may be going at, say, half the speed of light uh, experiences time much slower than we do on the Earth. So let us say in a voyage where it might take 100 years Earth time, they might have only experienced 10 years on board the ship. So they leave, come back, say, 20 years later, um, and 100 years have passed on the Earth, but only 20 years for them. Well, the life support problem is now much smaller. Uh, we can imagine years of life support in space as opposed to centuries and so on. So if you could get up to a reasonably high speed, and that's not implausible with, say, nuclear fusion rockets, you could actually get relativistic ships. Now, what would happen, of course, most of these would actually take Earth time, probably centuries, so you'd come back to a very different world, uh, and the people who launched it would never see it, but the people who went out and came back would come back to a, a, a different world. So that's the third possibility. And then the fourth possibility is what we call download ships. Now, this is, uh, again, driven by uh, something quite distinctive, the idea, and this, you know, uh, Ray Kurzweil's written about it, Danny Hillis has written about it, the idea of downloading consciousness into some kind of electronic medium. So we make a copy of ourselves into an electronic medium of our consciousness, and that is what is launched to the stars. No life support needed, it's some kind of electronic device, and it flies off to the stars and can last as long as we like. As long as the electronic medium lasts, it lasts. The advantage of this, of course, we saw in Avatar because what you can do with an electronic medium, then download into some other form at the other end. And if you are on an in inhospitable planet for human beings, why, it might be just fine for your electronic device that gets there or a organism designed for that planet. So it allows you to explore non-Earth-like planets as well. So that becomes another possibility if we can invent that. And why would we do that? Well, you know, this is really how you pursue immortality. Uh, this is the pursuit not necessarily of space flight, but very long life. Uh, and so this might come from a very different kind of pursuit. So that's the, uh, the uh, four possibilities for how we might actually live long enough. Build ships that take a long time, multiple generations, sleep ships, relativistic ships with different time frames, and download ships. So we've answered the questions a little bit of how to propel it, how to uh, live long enough, but maybe the problem isn't quite as hard as we thought. And Freeman Dyson gave us a new point of view on what the interstellar medium might be like. Freeman. There's no reason to believe that the space between the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt is empty. Let me just check on the time. So we have about 10, 10, 10 minutes to go, but I'll probably run a bit over that. We know that a large fraction of all stars are born with planetary systems. It's likely that large numbers of planets are also born unattached to stars. And we know that the normal process of formation and evolution of planetary systems results in the ejection of planets and of comets from the system. 
As a result of these processes, the universe probably contains more unattached planets than stars and billions of times more unattached comets. The space between our solar system and the, non and the nearest stars is probably infested with unattached planets and far more numerous unattached comets. In addition, there may be other objects of intermediate kinds which we have not yet observed, from snowballs to black dwarf stars. It's quite conceivable that some of the intermediate objects might be alive, a population of mythological monsters making their home in space. The Polynesians were navigating the Pacific for a thousand years before the Europeans crossed the Atlantic. Island hopping came first, intercontinental voyages later. It's likely that the future of our traveling beyond the solar system will follow the same pattern. So I think this is a very important idea. What Freeman is telling us is that unlike our previous image of a vast empty ocean between here and the nearest stars, that it is in fact populated by lots of matter. Planets, comets, black stars, brown dwarfs, and so on. What that means is that instead of one big leap like Columbus had to do, it might be smaller steps from the solar system to the cometary clouds, to the outer clouds, to some more objects along the way. And critically, what it means is you might be able to pick up fuel along the way, hydrogen and other carbonaceous materials. You might be able to pick up food and maybe even water along the way. So it changes the nature of the problem fundamentally. It says maybe we can get there stepwise, just like the Polynesians did crossing the Pacific rather than Columbus did crossing the Atlantic. And so this is really a very big idea. Uh, if Freeman is right, and he has a tendency to be right, and, and the logic of it is, I, I think, very compelling, that the nature of the problem is therefore not nearly as profound as we might have imagined, that we can get there stepwise rather than in a big leap. So all of that fits in. Now, there's one big wild card in this story, something that could, again, change the question of why we want to go to the stars. And it is this, ET, uh, extraterrestrials, right? Question, is there life in the universe elsewhere? Well, of course, today we have detected no life anywhere else in the universe, not in our solar system, not anywhere else. There are little hints here and there on Mars, maybe little hints out at Europa, Titan, and so on. But any meaningful detection of life? No. And certainly not the planets that we've actually detected elsewhere in the universe yet. Uh, but I think the odds are, and I think uh, a lot of scientists would agree, that at least in some group of planets somewhere, we will find some indication of life. And you know, at a minimum, it'll be scum. You know, think about uh, you know, a, a, a kind of lake with uh, uh, algae and bacteria and like that growing. Fairly simple life. Uh, Earth, say, a billion years ago. Uh, before most of life developed. That's what it might be like. There's a pretty good chance we'll find galactic scum. Uh, but you might even get a bit better than that, a real biosphere, you know, plants, animals of various sorts. Uh, that seems quite plausible. But the big kahuna, of course, is intelligent life. Uh, uh, will we find any hint of intelligent life? And I think the odds of that are very poor. You think about, again, how big the universe is. You know, our galaxy has several billion stars in it, uh, uh, and there are billions of galaxies. And the universe is about 14 billion years old. Our Earth is only 4 billion years. So many civilizations could have come and gone elsewhere in space and time, and we'd never know it. It could be so far away, we'd never see them. Or so far back in time, we'd never, they, every trace is gone after a billion years or so. So the odds of that are very, very, very poor. Uh, unless it's common, which we may discover, that in fact life has spread around the universe and we find you know, we're part of a galactic community that we just didn't know about. Uh, now, I say all of this because, of course, this is a very powerful motivator, i.e., why go to the stars? So now I want to turn to that question uh, in a little bit more rigorous fashion. As I said, I do scenario planning, and good scenarios are built around rigorous analysis and good imagination. Well, we've been doing a fair amount of imagination so far. Let's do a little bit of rigorous analysis. 
And uh, to do that, I basically built scenarios using the United Nations long-term population forecasts. The UN a few years ago uh, did uh, just a kind of numerical exercise to look at what would happen if today's fertility rates stay roughly the same, and you would get a, a scenario of that is moving relatively flat along here, fairly stable population somewhere around 9 billion, uh, a couple billion more than we have. Uh, if the fertility rate goes up just about a half a point <clears throat> over 300 years, what happens? We get a population of 36 billion. Um, or if it drops by about a half a point, it drops to about 2.5 billion. So we have a range of possible population forecasts of 2.5 billion to 36 billion, a tenfold range. It's huge. So I asked myself questions, well, well, how could that all happen? What would allow us to happen? Why? You know, it's not hard to imagine that it stays the same, i.e. the fertility rate comes down roughly around the world, and we end up with a relatively stable population. That's what most people think is going to happen. Second possibility is what would lead us to increase population rather dramatically. And, and the only possibility I could come up with was religion. If you think about who wants to have lots of babies, it's the conservative religions. Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, uh, even the Jews, but we're too small to count, you know, we don't matter. Uh, <laughs> We could have a lot of babies and it wouldn't add up a lot. Uh, but there's a billion Muslims, there's a billion Hindus, there's a billion Christians. They all decide to have a lot of babies. The women decide it's a good thing to have lots of babies for the faith. They could change the population forecast. And that's how you could get to a high population. Maybe not 36 billion, but 20, 30 billion. A lot of people. And religion is what you'd need for the discipline uh, to live on an earth like that. Imagine cities that all look like Manhattan, cities of 100 million each, hundreds of such cities, high density, uh, leave the rest of the land for uh, agriculture. Think uh, uh, Paolo Soleri's arcologies as a model. Um, so that's what a religious scenario might be like. Uh, the second scenario is really kind of stability. And in this scenario, this is the scenario I've decided to say the environmentalists are right. Uh, that, in fact, uh, if you have too many people, uh, we're just not going to be able to be sustainable. This is a world of de depleting resources, water, air, climate change, a real mess on the earth uh, where survival really becomes an issue. And then the final scenario is as we live longer, we have fewer children and uh, wealth and long life go together. So you imagine uh, a world of great wealth that eventually most of the world catches up with the industrialized West and we all live at a very high level, but relatively few people, two and a half billion people, lots of rich people living in big estates all over the world, uh, but not too many of them, um, about two and a half billion of them. So those are my three kind of core scenarios. And out of that, then I said, well, all right, now let's put all these pieces together how we get to the stars, uh, why we're going to the stars, into several possible scenarios. So the first scenario is we can't, OK? Call it stuck in the mud, right? We're stuck in the mud that we got here. It's the our solar system forever. That's all. We can't solve the problem of keeping people alive. We can't solve the propulsion problem. And I can tell you, most serious scientists and engineers would say, that's the scenario. You know, live with it. It's the solar system, period, end of story. Well, you know, I'm not sure that's such a great scenario. It kind of lowers the horizons of humankind pretty fundamentally. But it is certainly, you'd have to say, given today's science, the scenario that you would have to bet on. However, suppose actually we do find ET out there. We do get some signals out there. Well, one of the things we learned uh, in the age of exploration, that one of the important motivators for exploration was, of course, bringing the word of God to the heathens. So imagine a second possible scenario, God's galaxy. Um, <laughs> and in this scenario, it's an interstellar race to save the souls of the aliens, right? The Christians have got their ship going, the Hindus got their ship going, and the Muslims got their ship going, and they've got a race to the stars. Uh, now, I will tell you that the only people who have a plan on the Earth to actually deal with aliens are, of course, the Vatican. They actually do have a plan. They have a white binder at the Vatican. The, uh, 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 the Vatican astronomer actually has a plan for what to do when the aliens arrive. Because, of course, if you're the Vatican, you've got to have an answer, right? You know, what happens when the spaceship lands, you know, in St. Peter's Square, and, you know, the Pope is greeted with an alien. You know, has he been saved? Right or not? Did Jesus show up there or not? Did Allah show up there or not? So it's, a, it's actually a meaningful theological question. But it's a very powerful motivator. Uh, and one can imagine also 
if this is a, 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 a religious-driven scenario, this is the scenario of generation shifts. Think monastery, right? Discipline for generations. So you think about a ship designed to carry the monks, to carry the mullahs, uh, to carry uh, uh, the priests all into deep space to bring the word of God to the aliens. Uh, so that is if we find something out there worth converting. Uh, so that is uh, the first of our real interstellar scenarios, God's galaxy. Let's take a look at the second scenario. Uh, escape from a dying planet. Well, as I said, suppose the environmentalists are right, that 9 billion exceeds the carrying capacity of the planet, and we're really in serious trouble. Well, the different civilizations of the Earth, say the Anglophiles, the Chinese, the Indians, the Arabs, all decide they're going to save their civilizations and begin to launch slow ships, sleep ships, because now we want to carry a lot of people on board. You know, thousands of people all in sleep, lots of embryos uh, unborn to be born on the new planet in distant space, basically to start over. Uh, and a lot of people think this is absolutely essential because otherwise our species is genuinely at risk, particularly if we maybe get hit by an asteroid or something like that along the way. So the second scenario is save the species via sleep ships. Uh, and you get in fact, long, slow voyages to distant stars, even if those stars appear uninhabitable, the planets appear uninhabitable, uh, or at least there's some kind of biosphere that might be uh, 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 livable. So that's the, the third of our scenarios. First is we can't, second is God's galaxy, and third is escape from a dying planet. But of course, today, the space effort is being driven by some really interesting people. You know, NASA's in a bit of trouble, it's got budget problems, but of course the really interesting story are people like Richard Branson, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, all with private space programs, right? Uh, so the third, final scenario is trillionaires in space. <laughs> um, it's going to take trillions, and so you think the great-grandson of Richard Branson, or of course we've got long life, maybe Richard himself, uh, or Elon's great-grandchildren, or Bezos' great-grandchildren, uh, now going to the stars. And of course, you allow a couple hundred years at a compound interest rate, and billions become trillions. Uh, so they're able to fund it. Um, and of course, uh, billionaires like to go fast, trillionaires. So they, they're the ones who build, first of all, the relativistic ship, right? Uh, so their ships go faster. They're the ones who actually can have slow life in space while fast life happens here on Earth. Or secondly, the download ship, right? Billionaires and trillionaires want to live forever, right? So they're the ones who solve the download problem and copy themselves into a, some kind of electronic device and send themselves off to the stars. And finally, they're the ones willing to take the big risks to fund really outrageous research, things that might actually lead to fundamental new physics and go faster than light. So one can imagine the scenario of trillionaires in space uh, in races. You can just see Elon and Richard and Jeff heading out for their separate stars uh, and see who gets there first, right? Uh, and gets there fastest and so on. And you know, as ridiculous as that sounds, if I'd said to you 10 years ago that the space program would be driven by Richard Branson, somebody you'd never heard of called Elon Musk, and the guy who's doing Amazon, uh, that is now the space program. Well, that is, in fact, today the reality. So this is a scenario which has already begun to play out on Earth today. It is not implausible over the next couple hundred years. So those are the four scenarios. We're stuck on Earth. We're stuck in our solar system. We're bringing the word of God to the universe. Or we're trying to escape our dying planet. Or we are racing to the stars with the trillionaires. Now, I put these together, these several scenarios, but these all can be combined in different ways. There are many scenarios here, different motivations, different forms of propulsion, uh, different levels of population. These are just three or four versions of many scenarios. The point is that there are many different ways of doing this. There isn't a single way. There's no one single right answer. So in conclusion, basically, and this is the conclusion that essentially Jim asked me to think about and came to, that there are many, many pathways to the stars. That most of them actually get us there. There's a few that don't, but most of them actually eventually get us there. They may not be 100 years or 200 years, but we will get there given these. So the bottom line is, yes, a galactic civilization is almost inevitable. The fate of humankind is to, in fact, play out our lives, play out our civilization on the galactic stage, not the solar stage. So one day, your children, or my son Ben here, will have the opportunity 
to travel to the stars, to see the universe, and to bring humankind into the greater galaxy. Thank you very much. If you want to see the full videos, uh, that's the URL for the conference. All the videos are on, the, on that site. All right, Peter. Meanwhile, back down on, here on Earth, in this appallingly slow local time zone <laughs> that we're caught in, uh, Jim Benford gets the first question, how can Long Now contribute to interstellar thinking? Uh, well, I think this is one way we can do it, is to uh, spread the idea. But I think, uh, uh, I expect we're going to be around for a long time, uh, long now, uh, decades, maybe centuries. So I think we can come back and revisit this problem every once in a while, report to you and say 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. So, you know, come back for the next lecture, say, in 50 years' time. Uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, 117. So, you know, I may be moving a bit slower on stage by then, but uh, I'll come back and report to you then and see how we're doing. Um, there's always the fatal flaw uh, mode, and as soon as Freeman Dyson said, well, there's lots of stuff out there, and we can do island hopping, and, and don't worry, there's comets and planets hither and yon. Uh, the, you know, the first happy thought is, great, we'll just go from island to island. And then the second unhappy thought is you're going rather fast and probably not able to uh, veer. And isn't there just lots of stuff that will absolutely collide with and that's the end of the trip? Well, yeah, the, the truth is that is a well-recognized risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you didn't have big rocks out there to run into, uh, dust, just simply the interstellar medium of a lot of dust, you know, uh, imagine trying to fly through a sandstorm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, in, instead of being as dense as a sandstorm, you're moving fast, that it, its apparent density is much greater. So it's a real issue. One needs to devise technologies for actually handling that. So, for example, one of the thoughts was the front end of your spaceship should be a giant ice ball with your water, for example, and that is your uh, deflection device, and that's what, mm -hmm. you know, the dust and any rocks that you may encounter bounce off of. You have something sort of sacrificial in front, a really exactly. big bumper exactly. that it takes Precisely. the shock, and that's So that. it's a real issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if you're moving near the speed of light, of course, your radar beam out in front of you, you know, you're going to be right behind it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it is, uh, you, 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 it's a real challenge and, and shouldn't be dismissed. Or a really seriously hungry ramjet that likes all that stuff. Yeah, so that's the other part. Yeah, but there you're, you're aiming for hydrogen, not big rocks. John Bethauser asks, what are the best steps within our solar system to prepare for interstellar voyage? Well, I think there are two big things. One is continue to develop the rockets, the, the propulsion, not chemical rockets, nuclear and then ultimately fusion rockets, for actually uh, exploring our solar system. Uh, uh, and make sure that you have to have the capacity to take human beings. I mean, we, we can do amazing things with the robots. We're going to hear about the Mars lander, I think, in the next lecture, right. which is you know, truly one of the most virtuous technical achievements anybody's ever done in astronautical engineering. But having said that, building spaceships that can carry people around, the universe, around our solar system is number one. And number two is life support. You know, can you actually create uh, life support that keeps you alive for years, uh, not months, uh, for deeper space voyages, Jupiter, uh, uh, Saturn, and so on? And those are voyages that are years long. And if we solve the years problem, then the decades problem becomes somewhat easier. So I think those are the two big things. Can we build rockets, I mean, via, you know, spaceships that actually get us around the solar system, and can we peop keep people alive? Well, the best planetary exploration that's happened so far is without people on board, right. you know, including the recent Mars landing. Uh, curiosity, these are robots. And the trend seems to be that space exploration is not done by meat sacks like us. It's done by, uh, you know, downloadable or transmissible intelligence and digitally guided, increasingly AI smart robots. Uh, and as soon as Werner Vinge's singularity happens, presumably the robots will look at us across that membrane and say, we're going, you're not. Hey, that's a plausible scenario. I mean, I, uh, it, it, is, it is virtually certain that the first things that go to the star, I mean, we already have it, Voyager, uh -huh. you know, is already on its way. Uh, and uh, the intentional missions, 
mm -hmm. uh, of sending something, say, to Alpha Centauri or uh, out to uh, one of the uh, rocky planets of, that we've discovered further out, uh, that will almost certainly be unmanned, mm -hmm. uh, that we will want to launch those probes in any event, uh, in part to test that hypothesis of the nature of the interstellar medium. So that will almost certainly happen mm -hmm. first. Um, I think robots are, are really great. I think we can do a lot with that. And, you know, I'm enormously impressed with what we've learned. I mean, the Cassini mission around Saturn is just spectacular. But there's something deeper going on here. And, and, and I think that's what this is really about, is about humanity's aspirations, our dreams, our visions, our sense of purpose, something larger than we are. Uh, and by this, I don't mean anything spiritual, though there, that's true for many other people. I mean just that sense of constant moving forward as a human species. And I think that's what will drive us toward the stars, that that motivation is really, really deep in our uh, genes, that we somehow want to go out. Uh, that's what's driven us around the world. It's one of the motivations that's driven around the world, not only it's what you know, drove us in part to, this, uh, to go to the moon. Uh, one hopes that we have the equivalent of a good motivation like the Cold War uh, that managed to get us to the moon. Without the Cold War, probably no moon flight, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, with no war, probably no rockets either. Uh, so, you know, we wouldn't have the V2 without World War II, no Werner von Braun, no Saturn, so on. So, you know, uh, I, I think we need to find other motivations than war to develop these things. But human motivations uh, seem to drive our uh, need to go outwards. Okay, as a skilled scenarioist, you've given us all these giddy multiplicity of ways to get out there. Play out the stuck in the mud scenario a little bit. Well, look, as stuck in the mud on, on, in our solar system, still it's a fairly rich body of planets. There's a lot of stuff one can do by way of exploration. But basically, we're not, the, the only real alternative other than exploration, maybe the space colonies that you wrote about, Stuart, you know, 30 some, 40 some years ago, mm -hmm. i.e., hollowed out asteroids and people living near Earth orbit out at Lagrangian points near the moon. Spinning that sort tin of, cans with, you know. Yeah, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's plausible. But I find it, unless we do some serious terraforming of Mars, and that's a millennial problem, mm -hmm. that uh, significant, uh, meaningful presence off the Earth is very unlikely. Uh, another practical question, Emaya asks, when you get, quote, there, what mechanism do you use to decelerate, or you just to go zinging past it near the speed of light? But that's a really <laughs> that was a really good planet. It's too late. <laughs> well, all, aside from the sail, the basic rocket, the, race, you know, the, the nuclear rocket, the fission mm -hmm. rocket, uh, fusion rocket, you can basically reverse the rocket, you know, point it in the other direction, mm -hmm. and use your rocket to slow you down. Uh, if we let that uh, clip with uh, Jim talking about sales run a bit longer, uh, uh, Forward came up with ways of modifying the trajectory of the vehicle uh, and actually maneuvering in deep space, still using just like sails, maneuvering with wind. So that becomes possible. Though there's a great uh, science fiction story, in fact, Tau Zero, there's something called the Tau Foundation. Tau is uh, the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared, and Tau equals zero at the speed of light. And it's about a spaceship that is one of these bussard ramjets, and they can't stop it, right? It just goes faster and faster and faster and faster. It's zipping through solar systems, zipping through galaxies at relativistic speeds. And people can feel it. Oh, there's a speed bump, another galaxy we just went through, right? Because uh, they experience millions of years in seconds, because uh, they're at 0 0.999999C. Uh, and it, you know, it basically dealt with the problem, what happens if you can't stop? Ah. Uh, well, it does call attention to this, how narrow-minded this project is so far. You're not talking about intergalactic travel at all. Oh, you're right. We, we're not yet, we, we have not yet <laughs> begun to think about how we visit Andromeda, for example, <laughs> or even the Magellanic Clouds, which are in our neighborhood, sort of mini galaxies in, in the orbit. And in fact, something I would recommend to people, amazing experience. One of the other speakers there, which I didn't show, uh, what was the name of the, the gardener? Uh, uh, John Lomborg. So John Lomborg uh, is a painter, an artist who painted the uh, space scenes for Cosmos and for the uh, Smithsonian. In Kona, he has built a garden that's open to the public. It's called the Galactic Garden. It's about 150, it's about, about the, fact, the size of this hall. Uh, and uh, it is, think about a, 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 a garden maze, right? But now it's the arms of the galaxy, right? And he there has a little group of, of, of leaves about this big, on each of which is a couple little dots 
of uh, uh, diamonds and gold. Each of those is a star. Uh, it's our whole little neighborhood. And mm -hmm. then you see this one little uh, cast, uh, little uh, wall of plants, and that's just a local little bit of an arm of the galaxy. And then you realize just how big it is. I mean, I, I was an amateur astronomer as a kid, and I had no idea how big the galaxy was until I walked around Lomborg's Galactic Garden. If you get to Kona, it's worth going to see the Galactic Garden. Great, it thanks. will awe you. So you spent time chatting with uh, Perlmutter about uh, you know, is there more possibilities uh, in physics? And since he stirred up one of them, he's presumably optimistic that there's a lot more weirdness to mm -hmm. come. What's, and he must have talked about this, what does he think about interstellar travel and, and reinventing physics? Oh, he thinks it's unlikely. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, um, and, I mean, Saul's a, a, a genius, uh, but as, as uh, Einstein described himself as the last classical physicist, he grew up in the world of Newtonian physics and reinvented it. Uh, uh, but he never could intuitively grasp the world that he invented himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he never was comfortable with quantum theory, for example. Said, you know, that was the famous life, God, life uh, line, God does not play dice with the universe. Uh, uh, and so he was very uncomfortable with the universe that was the result of the physics he helped create. I think the physicists who are creating this new universe mm -hmm. uh, uh, have a hard time being comfortable with the new universe that they might be leading to. Here's another practical question from James Welcher, who's basically saying, Cosmic radiation out there is fierce and constant, and uh, so far, ways of, of masking it, unless you're a robot, is, uh, involves a whole lot of mass. How is, the, is anyone dealing with that issue? Yeah, the, the, the point that's being made in the question is that one of the discoveries we've made in recent years is that uh, we actually do have a problem of even interplanetary flight, let alone right. interstellar flight, that uh, solar radiation is pretty intense. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly if you have a solar storm and you get you know, a big burst of radiation, uh, you would need on board shelters. And in fact, the space station has a, a plan. If you get hit by a solar storm, there are areas that are denser than others to protect yourself. The, the general idea that people have talked about is some kind of mass, and this goes back to the water idea. Mm -hmm. You know, you basically put the living capsule inside a big volume of frozen water, and you use that water to protect yourself against radiation till you get to where you want to go. Steve from Livestream, that's how he describes himself, says, what changes in our assumptions about resource allocation and economics will be needed before anyone can seriously undertake a project like this? Well, look, I think... Uh, we don't actually have to uh, make big changes. I mean, f uh, first of all, let's just take a look at the three different scenarios. Uh, well, the religious scenario, well, who's the wealthiest people on the planet? It's the Vatican, right? I mean, they have no trouble with resources. I mean, they've managed to assemble. You want to see wealth? Go see the Saudis uh, if you want to see religious support there uh, and so on. So, uh, you know, uh, religious wealth, if it chooses to be directed in this way, plenty of it to go around. Uh, desperation, okay, well, that's the second scenario. Um, and that's a harder economic challenge, but it is the competitive challenge of different civilizations and marshalling the resources of, for survival. I, be uh, I bet this question, if we're scrabbling for resources, pooling vast resources to jump out of it actually is one of the things that gets precluded when you're scrabbling for probably, resources. Probably, unless you get so desperate that it really is a lifeboat kind of mentality. Right, and some entity puts up a large wall and with its resources, keeping yeah. everybody else out. And, and the third escape. one is really rich people and compound interest. <laughs> no. Well, that was, uh, you know, the Long Now Foundation is partly based on uh, Robert Heinlein's Long Range Foundation in the book Time for the Stars, uh, in, in which they were basically, uh, they accumulated so much capital that they would have to, they had the fear of stupid ways to just get rid of it, spend it on things like uh, space travel. Well, I mean, look, we see And then it pays off usually, and they become, you know, like the Long Now Foundation will one day become the most rich entity around, they can do anything. Well, we're seeing it out in San Francisco Bay almost every day, and maybe for one more day, uh, uh, what billionaires will do with their money, right? right? Build really outrageous sailboats. Uh, here's a question, a little biology question. Kartik asks, uh, what do you think of the possibilities of finding life forms based on something other than carbon? Uh, very good question. I mean, we are, we are basically carbon life forms. There are various other combinations of uh, chemical compounds that might yield things 
that uh, 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 phenomena that would be life uh, living systems. So there's been talk about uh, systems built on silicon, systems built on uh, 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 phosphorus, uh, various combinations of chemicals that, like carbon, can combine in various ways to yield self-replicating systems. And that's the issue. Can they replicate? Uh, carbon is easy to replicate. It is uh, quite, quite common uh, in our particular neck of the woods. But one can imagine that there are other chemical compounds that could be uh, put together to create life. And we've gotten little hints of that in some of the extremophiles uh, mm -hmm. here on Earth as well. So I, I think it's not implausible that we might find non-carbon-based life uh, elsewhere. Also, I could imagine uh, there's starting to be prospect of uh, a different form of, of genetic code that we and other life forms might operate on where you throw in an extra chromosome, which is not uh, you know, the kludgy spaghetti code that a zillion years of random evolution has given us. It's uh, smart engineers putting things, you know, where they belong and making it really efficient and uh, better. And the wheel is better than the leg. And there's things like that. You could do that genetically. So you can imagine <clears throat> some life forms being developed, which might be a continuity of us or squirrels, who knows, that are uh, very smart squirrels that... <laughs> You know, you just crank up that dial, right? Uh, they get to be the, instead of robots, they're basically genetically space-adapted creatures that uh, are way better than, than us at living in any place other than this you know, kind of narrow little biological envelope we're good well, at. I, actually, I think that's a very plausible scenario. Genetic mm -hmm. modification of human beings or other organisms to mm -hmm. actually make them better suited, both in life or size. I mean, you know, one can imagine little tiny space explorers um, mm -hmm. or very long-lived space explorers that mm -hmm. are uh, genetically modified. This morning, Science Times, I had an article on, on how complex uh, uh, chromosome, uh, genes actually are, uh, that it turns out to be much more complicated than we even thought. You know, so uh, we have a lot of learning to do, but one can imagine that out of that comes the ability to do that. Ralph asks probably a question that many 20-somethings, which he describes himself as. Uh, he, in fact, he's a 20-something with a BA in philosophy. What... Would you suggest that Ralph do to dedicate his life to this problem? Learn science. <laughs> <laughs> For starters, that, that's not a bad thing. Um, take a vow of poverty, too, uh, and uh, find yourself a religious order committed to uh, the stars. I think the path is pretty well clear, isn't it? Or start one. Yeah. I mean, you know, one, I can't imagine a religion, not necessarily one of the existing ones, but one that takes shape, that is sort of shaped around, we are, uh, you know, the hell of the afterlife in heaven, we're going to just make it. Yeah. And go there and, and, and make it happen and come join, because we're all so happy now that this looks like a wonderful thing to dedicate our lives many generations to. When you were talking about the uh, religious version of God's galaxy, I was thinking, you know, you're right, monasteries, they've... They've done that sort of thing, a really dedicated, tight communities, intellectually based to some extent. They're the ones who do multi-generational cathedrals. Exactly. And they would just say, this is our cathedral. And it is you know, going to take generations, and we like that. And at Long Now, we approve of that. <laughs> but Long Now has a very strong guideline that we don't do religion. So it won't be us. Um, because religions get in trouble, and then you know, <laughs> that's a whole you're already in trouble. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Proof. <laughs> um, Mark Poppin raises a question that I think uh, uh, Craig uh, Venter did, which is why don't we send precursor life forms, uh, cyanobacteria or something, to other solar system, or maybe the other planets initially, so we get an idea how this works, and, and seed them. Uh, we'll probably do that by accident anyway. Um, that is, it is not implausible that we've already done it to Mars with our Mars landers. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, there's a lot of discussion in recently. You know, maybe we've exaggerated the need for that kind of purity uh, mm -hmm. and, and cleanliness. Uh, but having said that, I think it's a very good point. I think it's highly likely, actually, that if we discover, say, rocky planets with, say, water, mm -hmm. say that, but with no life, 
uh, uh, with... Uh, Are we finding that water is kind of common? More common than we might have thought. Right. But let's suppose... Comets we, and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so say we discover around a star fi within 50 light years that it's a watery world, mm -hmm. okay? But we can find no signs of any life. Well, we might, in fact, send some biological samples in advance to start populating that planet with uh, so a biosphere. Say, for example, the atmosphere might not be adequate for us. Well, in fact, we know that the symbiosis of uh, oxygen and CO2 and plant life and so on is how we produce an, a, a, an atmosphere we can breathe. You can imagine terraforming a water planet uh, to make it habitable just that way. Here's a question from, can't read the name, looks like Anki, Angie. Um, modest question. Is our solar system a valid spacecraft? Our solar system, well, you know, if you think about it, the answer is yes. Uh, it's a spacecraft moving around the galaxy. The galaxy, you know, the, these, uh, we live in a pinwheel galaxy, the Milky Way. There's a giant pinwheel with about three or four big arms that are rotating. The whole arms are moving. Each sun is moving around the center of that galaxy in a big orbit that takes about a couple million years to go around, uh, a couple hundred thousand years. Quarter million. Quarter million years, yeah. thank you for helping get it right quarter million years to make a single orbit. So it is a big spaceship. Our Earth is a spaceship going around the sun at about 65,000 miles an hour in its orbit. So, you know, uh, Buckminster Fuller was right. You know, and he wrote Operating Manual for Spaceship mm -hmm. Earth. We are a great big spaceship in an even bigger spaceship, our sun, our, our solar system, moving around our galaxy. But of course, our whole galaxy is moving away from the Big Bang mm -hmm. uh, into space that is expanding. Is that going to defeat efforts to steer the solar system to interesting places? I think uh, we're a ways yet from steering the solar system, um, uh, uh, I, I think. Uh, but, you know, uh, it, it's conceivable, uh, but I think that's a bigger problem than we're prepared to even think seriously about at the moment. How do you steer a solar system? <laughs> He's thinking about it. <laughs> No, I'm thinking about how to steer this conversation a little, a little further. Um, because it is a conversation that civilization is having with itself. Uh, as we get these capabilities, uh, we get the genetic capabilities, and get have to rethink a whole bunch of things. You get these uh, space travel capabilities. Uh, we see the photographs from the amazing Saturn work. We think about... Uh, Europa and you know, getting there in this movie that you mentioned and the, 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 the you know, we're doing de-extinction and people keep saying and are hearing, oh gosh, that was, you know, science fiction only last week. It's called Jurassic Park. Yeah. And so the science fiction to reality gradient keeps happening and we get sort of pissed off that some things don't happen. Uh, you know, the jetpacks or whatever it may be. But, and there was a period for about 10 years there where science, the science fiction writers, near as I could tell, got sort of freaked out by the idea of the singularity and that there was this event horizon that you couldn't predict beyond, and Charlie Strauss and a few others went zooming through it, but everybody else just said, screw it, I'm going to write about the present, it's pretty futuristic anyway. But now there's this, Neil Stevenson is you know, pushing hieroglyph, which is the idea of since the current generation of space explorers and really adventurous scientists were inspired, as you were, by certain science fiction that happened when they were 10 years old, they're trying to make the kind of science fiction that happened for 10-year-olds now. Uh, there's probably a great many more of them, not only female as well as male, but a whole lot of people in the world that are seeing Avatar and these movies and are exposed to uh, science fiction thinking that were not in the previous generation. So presumably there's a shock wave, a wave front of new science fiction inspired folks all over the world who have the ability now to connect with each other and there's kind of a Dyson sphere of visionaries who are in the mode of, well, why, why, why not? Let's you know, do this thing I read about that seemed kind of cool. Do you see that happening? Absolutely. Look, I mean, so many things we take for granted would have seemed 
absolutely outlandish, sending pictures through walls, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if I'd said to you in 1880, uh, before too long, we're going to be able to send pictures through walls. Yeah, but how do you do that through molecules of a solid wall? Well, you know, we do that every second, every day all over the planet. Right? Mm -hmm. Nobody thinks twice about television broadcasts any longer. Um, there are so many things of that character that have seemed completely implausible mm -hmm. that today are just quite routine. Some things have proven too hard. Energy has proven to be very difficult, hence no jetpacks, no mm -hmm. flying cars. Mm -hmm. uh, but many other things, I mean, our information devices are vastly more powerful than we only imagined a few years ago. Then we would all be carrying the equivalent of smartphones in our pocket, or cam every phone would have a camera in it. Uh, or now, you know, the Google Glass uh, begins to look like things that David Brin, science fiction writer, was only writing about only a few years ago. So uh, I, I think the interest in science fiction is still universal. Mm -hmm. I think you see it all over the world. Uh, science, there's a reason science fiction movies uh, everybody can identify with all over the planet. Um, and I think these do create a vernacular. You, look, you and I were involved in writing uh, uh, a science fiction film called Minority Report. Mm -hmm. And so many of the things we wrote uh, that we put on screen in that film have now come to pass. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a powerful tool. I think it is something that inspires imagination. I think it actually does make a difference. Um, and I think imagination is essential if we're actually going to have the kind of future that we want to have. In the absence of that imagination, uh, uh, life becomes very pedestrian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.